I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Um, for Chuck's benefit, I have to um, correct the uh, anonymity break that I made in the program. And uh, so we'll just call Sandy Beach the location of the meeting. <laughs> when this gets back to GSO, and I'll start over again and say, my name is Richard, and welcome to Sandy Beach. And, uh, I came into uh, AA on Pearl Harbor Day in 1964, and I haven't been drunk since my first meeting. And I've been to an awful lot of meetings since that first night, and I've done a lot of listening, and I'm convinced deep down in my heart that I owe it all to uh, not drinking. That is um, <laughs> my opinion of why I haven't been drunk since my first meeting is, uh, is that. But that's really not a miracle because, you know, in jails and nut houses, those places there wasn't any booze and I wasn't drunk either. So there uh, took place uh, the real miracle for me anyway. It was three or four months when one morning I got up and I was happy with not drinking. And that's contrary to the definition of an alcoholic. I mean, that is where it was all about. But I think it's important to mention the not drinking part. Um, at least I think so. Um, where I came in, um, I had a very rough sponsor and uh, and he emphasized it quite a bit, but occasionally uh, I get into some more intellectual meetings and uh, we get to a higher plane and so on down. And, you know, there may be somebody new here who hears about the spiritual awakening and um, peace of mind and all of those things. And I hate to break the news, but um, this not drinking part really fits in there. It's... Uh, it's I thought maybe in the beginning you could work the steps and then you'd have a spiritual awakening and you wouldn't have a problem with drinking anymore. And it's very difficult to have a spiritual awakening when you're throwing up in the toilet. It's a, um, a problem. And so if you've been having trouble over the years, uh, I, you know, check your drinking. I, uh, <laughs> It's just a suggestion like the rest of the program. Um, funny about those suggestions, you notice in the 12 and 12, it's very carefully hidden, but in almost every step, there's a little uh, sort of a cautionary flag, and it says something like, uh, failure to properly take step four could be fatal. <laughs> there's those... And there's one in every step. It's just, uh, l just little hints along the way as to the thing. And I um, remember my sponsor uh, telling me, um, what do you think that means when you see that alcoholism is fatal? And I'd been sober about two months. And I uh, said, well, I think what that really means, you see, is that uh, there's a certain uh, degree in the allergy and uh, there's a certain type of reaction that can set in for, for various people. And what you have, uh, well, they, they expire, is what you have. And he said, I think you've missed the point. Is what that says in there is, Sandy's going to die. That's what alcoholism is fatal. And he was always getting my name into the big book and getting... Uh, getting me into the steps because uh, I didn't want to be an Alcoholics Anonymous um, and I sat around and approached this like a course on alcoholism. I mean, it didn't apply to me. I just was going to uh, be able to pass a quiz in case there was one given later on, but uh, I just didn't have enough evidence to support the fact I was a real alcoholic. I had, you know, run into some difficulties along the way, but certainly uh, none to... Uh, you know, put me down at the bottom of the list in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that's, um, that was quite a step down from the nut ward. <laughs> to come in here, but uh, that's 
the way that uh, it happens to some of us. Before I forget it, I know I have a, a couple of things that have happened to me out here. It's really been an amazing set of coincidences, running into old friends, running into uh, new friends. And I just, uh, I have to tell you before, in case I forget at the end, and I sometimes get all mixed up, you will never know what I've already taken away from this meeting, I mean from this uh, weekend, especially the meeting this afternoon that's going to help me with uh, my children and, and some work i got to do, and uh, I just have to thank you now. I'm going to take away much more than I'll ever give, and I want to thank you in advance. And running into uh, my friend Rocky from Laguna, who uh, some of you may know, who was, um, is, and always will be the world's greatest fighter pilot, who had a, um, I remember 21 years ago when he put me on restriction for drinking, um, even then he had a strange sign over his door, uh, in case there's any aviators around here, he didn't even have that sign right. It said there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there's no humble pilots, you know, there was a strange way. I'm surprised any of us made the program. <laughs> the Pope has been extremely kind to uh, this uh, convention weekend. He has, uh, you may think with the name Beach that you're uh, free from any connection with bingo games and uh, Italian and so on down. But my mother's name was Brennan. <laughs> and my story, uh, childhood, has really been touched on rather um, in detail. But i got to go through it again because it's a very important part. I um, looked at step four. You know, step four divides us into two categories. And we uh, are either the guilt-oriented or the power drivers, as it says. And in either case, we use one of those two excuses not to take that inventory. Either we're so frightened of what we're going to find that we don't dare look, or on the other side of the coin, we simply say, all of my problems were caused by alcoholism, so the mere stopping of drinking will suffice, and I will return to my normal, charming self that I was before I started drinking. And um, in my case, I really couldn't say that about myself. I can say that I'm very glad that I'm an alcoholic, because I wasn't going anywhere before I started drinking. I had... Um, I, you know, I was uh, sort of a loser then, and alcohol just sped the thing along. It was just picked up momentum, because I was uh, brought up in New England and I, uh, in Connecticut, and my parents, I think, were uh, like a lot of people up in, in New England. They were trying to teach me to be the proper snob, uh, that feeling of that section of the country which sort of looks down on the rest of the country. It's the way it's located up there. And, uh, and I was sort of skinny and nervous, and I was running around going, God, it's hard to be a snob when you're uh, not as good as the rest of the people. And, uh, I was... Uh, but I didn't want to tell him that I was having a problem with this, and so I was uh, going around with the little Lord Fauntleroy suits and uh, in these little schools and all that. And uh, if that wasn't problem enough, then I was sent down to uh, have my first encounter with the nuns. And uh, I'm sure that the receiver was just as broken as the transmitter, and maybe all the other little kids didn't hear what I did. But boy, I'll tell you, that was a strange encounter. Because my memory tells me that it went something like this. Hello, little boy. Boy, are you in trouble. <laughs> You're in serious trouble, and sit down, we're going to tell you all about it. It's about time you found out about the world and, and the universe and where you fit in and where you're going. And I found out about original sin, and I found out about what happens to people who aren't perfect, and I found out that I was having a terrible problem, 
and I picked up a, a buddy right about that time. It was a companion that I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous, and it took me seven years to finally release this wonderful friend that stood by me all through the years. It was called guilt. I had this guilt thing. It was sort of an innate guilt. It was a guilt that was uh, I was born with. It's primordial guilt. I mean, I was guilty. I felt guilty about not knowing what God wanted me to do. I felt guilty about having done whatever I did that caused God to not let me know what he wanted me to do. And uh, then I felt guilty about wanting to get rid of the guilt because I didn't deserve to get rid of the guilt because I really was guilty of all the things that made me feel guilty. Other than that, things were going pretty good. There was, uh, until I heard about purgatory. And I, uh, and I got a scorecard, and I got a pad and a pencil, and I started adding up. And uh, by the time I was 12 years old, I had around 85, 86,000 years to do in purgatory. Uh, and, uh, on just the things I had thought about doing. I hadn't even, uh, I hadn't even done them. And, um, and I kept telling my brain, uh, you've got to stop thinking that stuff. You've got to be good. And, that's, you know, and uh, my brain said, the only way I do that is if you keep your eyes shut. And I uh, had the same problem around the pool today. up around 25,000 years. Uh, <laughs> oh. Anyway, what I had to do with all this was keep it a secret and never tell anybody and never share because uh, I really believe, truly believe, that nobody else had this problem. I really believe that all the other kids uh, growing up and the other teenagers as I got a little older had life in their hands and they were just living it. And if they ever found out what was really going on inside of me and what uh, kind of a person I really was and what God thought about me, and what was the real truth about me, it would be awful. And I had to be very careful to never share anything about myself with anybody. So I've always tried to be sort of the snob and uh, off away from people, mostly because they frightened me. If I was in a strange city and standing on the sidewalk and somebody came up and said, pardon me, that's my spot, I wouldn't argue with them. I would say, fine probably is his spot, you know, the way they do it in this city. Well, I know. I would, uh, I had to do better than anyone in order to feel equal. Um, it was a strange set of things, and uh, people frightened me, mostly people frightened me. I was afraid to make eye contact with people, and of course when I'm, I got drinking, it became even worse, but I just had that problem that the secret, the truth, was going to come out. So I had a problem with the truth, had a problem with God, had a problem with people, but other than that, um, had a pretty happy childhood. <laughs> I have to say that in case my mother's in the audience. Uh, anyway, I um, ended up at um, the local university in New Haven. I thought I thought that was a local place at Yale until I got out of there and everybody said, oh, that's a nice place. So I'll, uh, I got there and went into a large reception room one night and had the normal feeling that I had when I walked into a room. There's about 50 guys in there from all over the country and all dressed up. And I had the feeling they all turned and looked at me and said, um, what's that guy doing in here? 
but the normal feeling I had. I could see in their eyes that hostility. I could see rejection. I could just see what they were thinking. And I was terrified. I said, what if these guys find out about me? And they were passing some drinks around. And uh, I had been keeping some kind of a pledge. I don't remember what it was for. Probably to cut the sentence in half or... Um, <laughs> There was tremendous peer pressure uh, to, to, to just conform. I was, I'm just, I decided that's my thing, conforming. I finally have uh, accepted that as a way of life. And, you know, I learned that in AA. That's how you succeed in AA. You conform. Uh, you can smell the original thinkers in alcoholics. <laughs> conformed and that's how I started smoking and I got a croup cut and then I had wide ties this way and uh, and I got all these teenage kids and uh, that's uh, what they do and then they come home and tell me about this is how they display their individualism and there's a strange paradox in that I haven't figured it out yet it's uh, but uh, the drinks came around and I took a drink and whiskey off the tray and I drank it and I sat around waiting for this thing to happen that happens. I had heard people talk about alcohol and how great it made you feel. And alcohol had no effect on me. I can remember waiting for this to happen. And I stood in the room and I was waiting and waiting and there was nothing happening to me at all. But the room was changing. <laughs> and the people in the room were changing. And I sat there with this whiskey in my stomach, and I started looking back into the eyeballs around the room, and it was amazing how the hostility disappeared out of those eyes. And it was replaced with kind of a warm look. And another drink, and the people became immensely friendly. And some people were saying, hello, come over and talk to us. And uh, I just couldn't believe what was happening to the world just because I had a few drinks. The world became what it should be. The world became sort of the brotherhood of man, and there was this warm, friendly feeling, and I was at ease with myself, with the people, with God, with the universe, and it was just marvelous. And I had this peace of mind for about an hour, and I never forget that hour. And that hour is very important in my story, because at the end of the hour, I started throwing up. Um, and during the night I practiced throwing up and uh, the next day in, uh, in class I sat in the classroom with a couple hundred people and there a teacher was giving a lecture and I was sitting on my chair and all I was trying to do was stay on the chair I uh, wasn't trying to take notes I wasn't trying to listen to this teacher uh, because I figured if I broke my concentration, I might lose my balance off of the chair. And I got a smorgasbord of alcoholism. I cannot say that I wasn't warned. I got a little flavor of everything that I was going to get in the years ahead. I got a little taste of the um, chills. I got some of the itchy skin. You know how they get itch and it goes all around and it comes back down here and you're doing this little jiggling around? I had a couple of little spasms and uh, some cold flashes. Then I had some nausea gas came through the room, and I felt that mm, I was just doing that with my mouth. I just sort of a little smattering of, uh, of, of everything I was going to get. Like God was going to say, here it is, buddy. This is what you help you make your decision, um, which way you're going to go. And I made that decision that night. The crowd got back together, and they said, Sandy, we're going to go out drinking again. Do you want to go with us? And my body, especially my stomach, said, wrong, no, veto, out, out, no, no, no. All of us vote against it. However, the brain was in charge of the um, package at that particular point in time, soon to be overthrown. Uh, but the brain was in charge, and it said, wait a minute, fellas, we're going to have to consider this. Wait a minute, we're, we're grown here now. We're going to think this over. We're going to be objective about it. Let's analyze it. Let's take a close look at it. From where I stand, 
all this little um, being sick and a few of these minor things that have happened to you, when you really calculate it, is a rather small price to pay for that hour that you had last night. And I thought about that, and I thought about that, and I said, boy, you're damn right. And I went back out and started drinking with the boys. And, you know, that's the same story I told myself until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a small price to pay for all the fun that I'm having from drinking. And, of course, as the years went on, the hour got shorter, and the trouble got worse, and the equation still balanced. So the only thing that was improving was my ability to rationalize. That was getting better. That's the one thing that alcohol seems to sharpen up and hone and get down to perfection. So that it came to one time I got through in down here in um, uh, Nuevo Laredo. Oh boy, over the border, gone for three days and uh, blackout, and got up, woke up in jail down there, and uh, had to be back on a base. I don't remember the weekend, but my teeth had been knocked out again. I'm. Uh, have an 0 and 10 fight record for, uh, for, uh, and uh, so I had all this money going. I had to face my wife and come back where I've been for three days. And it was just, you know, and um, my conscience, which was always there when my wife wasn't, uh, would say, well, what do you got to say about that? I said, I'm not saying anything on Sunday morning. I got to get back. I need a beer and I got all this. And I can remember getting back and uh, I told my conscience, wait till I find the guys I was with and we'll let them decide whether I had a good time or not. Because I have, didn't remember the whole weekend. And I got together with them and you know how you lead people through when you don't want to tell them you don't remember. Hey, you remember Friday night? And they said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, yeah, we were here and there. And then I found I was dancing on a table and I did some of these other tricks. And uh, I said, well, in your opinion, I had a good time. And they said, yeah, oh, you had a marvelous time. And secretly I thought to myself, well, thank God, because I paid a hell of a price for that good time. <laughs> And I was now willing to balance the equation with a rumor that I had had a good time. And I had a terrible problem with the second step. What do you mean, return to sanity? I've always thought very logically and carefully. Terrible problem with that step. I, uh, I somehow one Saturday up at Yale, the guys were sitting around drinking, and they said, let's join the Marines. And I said, all right, I, you don't have anything else to do. We're out of beer. Um, and uh, six of us went down, and ha, ha, ha. And um, it was 14 years later I got thrown out. I got thrown out of the Marine Corps after I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a strange story. That uh, two years sobriety and uh, got passed over for the second time, and I'm all of a sudden I'm a civilian, and I had six children, and I didn't have a job, and I was resenting it, and I sat around my house, and self pity came in the window. I I don't know how it got there. I was working the program perfectly, and. Uh, <laughs> And I said, I got cheated. And I started talking to God. I said, hey, God, what, this, you know, what kind of a deal is this? I, you know, doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem fair. Remember how all these thoughts were creeping through. And um, I guess I had been out about um, two months, and I was reading the newspaper. And there was a small article in there about a plane crash. And there was a team of officers in the Marine Corps that was went around the country giving instructions. And uh, that was the team that I was on. And they were all killed. And if I had had my wish, of course, I would have been on the plane. And I can remember uh, sitting there feeling rather foolish. That was the first thing that came over me. And I remember and I tried to make a joke out of it. And I said, listen, God, if you had just told me, I mean, if you, uh, I really didn't like the Marine Corps at all anyway, and um, I, I just disregard all of the, what you've been hearing this morning and uh, in the past few days. Uh, 
and it's funny because things do happen to us, um, and then we have to stay sober and let some time go by, and then all of a sudden the reason for it happening. <laughs> but only if we're not drinking. Only if we're not drinking. I look back on that incident and I go, gee, suppose I started drinking. I would have been down with the, at the bar with the other losers who wouldn't be reading the paper either and would all be going. Isn't it unfair how these things happen to us? And so it is a, a good lesson for me that that incident did happen. But anyway, this crowd got in the Marine Corps and it was a terrible ordeal. Uh, and I soon found that I was not fit physically or mentally uh, to carry on the duties of an infantry officer, and so I signed up for flight school. Uh, that looked like the only logical alternative uh, to my dilemma, and I spent the next um, 12, 13 years uh, flying around in various kinds of jets, and I don't know, I really don't remember a lot of it. But the, um, I do remember this, that um, Marine Corps was kind of my hobby. Um, see, a hobby is something that you give about two hours a day to. And then the rest of it was being an alcoholic. Because this disease was progressing right on schedule. When I met, read Marty Mann's primer on alcoholism after I got sober, I thought she had been following me around because I just fit the page-by-page -page description of her book to a T, and it ruined my uniqueness. It was a terrible setback to read that book. But I, um, I did spend um, time at various spaces around here. I was in uh, Southern California for a year or two, and overseas, and so on down. But all of those things are kind of background music to being an alcoholic. Those uh, parts of our stories are interesting, and, and so on down. But to, to me, what I like to remember is what was going on inside of me. What was I thinking about when all this was happening? Mostly what I was thinking about was being afraid. Mostly what I was thinking about was that somebody's going to find out about me. Somebody's going to find out about the real me. And I loved alcohol because it sort of quieted these fears. And it gave me a chance to be somebody else. And I would be loud and laughing and carry on and pretend, I always pretended that everything was all right. It was critical to pretend that everything was all right. I had uh, been taught growing up that it was a sign of weakness to ask for help, that that would be a very vulnerable thing to do because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And if you ever ask for help, then the people out there would know that there was a chink in your armor, that there was a crack in the wall, and they would attack this weakness and would come right in. And so it would be very dangerous to ask for help. And a real man solves his own problems. A real man in the American dream pulls himself up by his bootstraps. None of this stuff going around, sharing and uh, all of these things. This, you know, and I, I learned this, I don't know where, from books, I learned it from movies, I learned it from what I thought other people were saying. And you know, the cowboy movies are kind of like that. You have a Western hero. He lives out in the desert alone with his horse. And whenever there's trouble in town, they call on him. And he comes in, he has those black gloves on, he goes into the bar, has a couple of drinks. He says, where's the trouble? They point out the trouble. He walks over, he shoots the guy. And uh, the townspeople go, we love you, we love you. And he runs back out in the desert with his horse. And, um, and now there's a real man. That's a real man. Um, and, you know, I think about that now, and I want, it's really weird to live alone in the desert with a horse. It's, uh, <laughs> the whole thing about that is, um, that was a strange thing to want to be, you know, to be like that. And um, I never understood uh, things. I would hear songs. Um, there's a song out now that I think alcoholics could well use as a theme song. It's called I Did It My Way. <laughs> I could have latched onto that when I was drinking, boy, you know. I don't care what the rest of the world says, man. I did it my way. Well, I'm here in jail, but I got here on my own. Uh, and everything's all right, man. I did it my way, you know. And uh, then I would hear songs like People who need people are the luckiest people in the world. I remember the first time I heard that, I said, that must be for weird people. That must be, that's a strange thing to be popular. People who need people are lucky. People who need people are weak.